Good morning. Good morning. Hello, back there. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Wycliffe Presbyterian, and welcome. I have a few announcements to make. Following the service today, we will meet in Fellowship Hall for birthday cake and beverages. There is a sign-up sheet in the narthex for the lunch bunch uh, on December 7th at 1 o'clock at Joey's in Wycliffe. Now, we had a thrift store yesterday. Do we have any announcements? Uh, yes, we do. We made $1,300 yesterday. If you guys went home tired, you were tired for good reason. Thank you. Great. On December 17th, I cordially invite you at 10 o'clock a.m. to the Christmas Cantata. Um, I think it will be a very beautiful and moving um, cantata. So please come and join us and bring as many friends. We don't mind singing to a crowd. On December 24th at 10 a.m., Christmas Eve morning service. And then on December 24th, did I say 24th? Yeah, 24th at 10 a.m. is Christmas Eve and, uh, morning service. And then on the 24th, also at 7 p.m., is the Christmas Eve candlelight service. December 31st at 10 a.m. we will meet in the Lion Chapel at Breckenridge. Are there any more announcements? Then let us be in the
for uh, the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a very important time of the year in the life of the church, and it's a very important time of the year in the life of the church members. We are glad that you're here today. We know a lot of you were busy yesterday, and I know that some, some of us uh, here uh, got home and were a little, uh, had a little ache and pain here and there, but it was for a good cause. And it's one of those things, when you think about it, when we're here for thrift store, it's like we're not really working. We actually enjoy what we do. And that should be the way in Advent too. It should not be just a, something we gotta do. It should be something that we enjoy. We should enjoy the friendship, the fellowship, the togetherness, and the coming together as, as a church to welcome the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us begin our worship this morning with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship here in your house. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds so that we may learn what you would like to teach us. Strengthen us for your service, not only on this day, but in all the days to come. Amen. The oldest traditions has been the lighting of the Advent wreath. There are four candles here, and each, and each week one will be lit for uh, the various meanings of hope, peace, joy, and love. On this day, we bear witness to the light of Christ with all the faithful of every time and place. With Isaiah and Jeremiah, prophets of Israel, we await the promised salvation of the Lord and look for the coming of the one who will bring justice and righteousness to the earth. Let us share the congregation's response. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory. Amen. Worship, worship I'm sorry, uh, as is printed in your bulletin. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel. To watch over your children like a flock. Sitting enthroned between the angels. Shining forth before your beloved one. Awake your power. Come and save us. Restore us. Make your face shine upon us, and we will be saved. And join me in the first hymn, uh, hymn 245, O Come, O Come, Amen.
I was very, very young, say 12. I got, my mother forced me to join the junior choir. And they, and the choir director got this crazy idea that we were going to do an epiphany service by singing all of our carols in parts, the 12 of us, okay? And there would be a reader who would, you know, and there would be two of them. They would go from through the scriptures, one on one side, one on the other. And everybody thought this lady was out of her mind. But she made it work. In fact, Linda had to do that service with the children's choir, what, two or three times? So it was became a tradition. So I understand what it takes to put a cantata together. Uh, this was the very first song we had to learn how to sing. And everybody says, you know, you always start Christmas with a with a song that does it sounds so sad. Well, the reason it sounds so sad is they have been waiting for so long <laughs> for the right Messiah to come and lead them out of it. And they are saying, let's hope that this time, this one is for real. So that is why we start Advent with that particular hymn. Now, as far as the, uh, you know, our, our days these days, I don't know about you, but if I get another email about, uh, you know, cyber deals or Black Friday deals being extended or any of those things, I think I'm going to go out of my mind. Uh, it used to be the day after Thanksgiving was just the day after Thanksgiving. When we were driving home, my uh, daughter and I from my sisters, we went to uh, Mishawaka, Indiana. There's a lot of, there's a mall that comes right up to the Indiana Turnpike. There wasn't a parking space available in any of those parking lots. You remember all the spaces that are always in the back? That go, but they were in there. And I'm thinking, wow. So this is, this is what we consider to be important. And that is uh, one of the things that our prayer of confession is about today. What is this season really about? So let us share the prayer of confession together. God of all time and seasons, how quickly the year spins by, and we may be caught unprepared for your advent. We are still recovering from Thanksgiving or the latest crisis of lengthy list of things to do. The demands on our time seem unending, the tasks seem overwhelming, and our energy is draining. Holy God, Sing to us in that cherishes the stillness of the moment. Speak to us in the depths of our hearts. Let there be a space for you amid all the hurry and the rush, a holy inner place that cherishes silence and song, which keeps a candle lit and a manger ready. God of all times and seasons, create in us a place for your birth. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. Jesus gave us the most extravagant gift of all, the offering of himself for us. Through this selfless gift, we are set free, and our sins are forgiven. And the people of God say together, Thanks, Thanks to God. God. Amen. Now let us share our uh, next hymn, number 244, Come Thou Long Expect.
um, Isaiah 64, 1 through 9. Um, you can follow me on, in the Pew Bible on page 783. I will be reading from the New Reverse Standard Version. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when the fire kindled brushwood, and the fire caused water to boil, to make your name known to your adversary, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awful, awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, perceived. No eye has seen any gods besides you who work for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteousness deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us in the hands of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The New Testament lesson comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It's on page 1193 in the Review Bible if you would like to follow along. Basically what Paul is saying is uh, because we know Christ and because Christ was with us, we become a changed people. We're going to be re re uh, reading verses from chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. May God bless the reading of his very special word on this day. Uh, we Americans, I guess, are not very tolerant of this road construction. I mean, there was some mild construction here at Wycliffe that I heard a whole lot of bad things about. Uh, it turns out that uh, I have a uh, personal trainer, and uh, we work out at uh, the Planet Fitness in North Randall. So I'd have to cross the 480 Bridge. And there was a time there when I'd be going uh, eastbound, and all of a sudden I'd see all these cranes and everything going and, and in between the eastbound and westbound bridge. And what the heck are they going to do now? Then, all of a sudden, you, you, there's these signs that come up that say trucks will be crossing road and all this kind of thing. And apparently, uh, you know, at the end it looked like, to, 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 of all things, they're going to build a bridge in the middle of the bridge. So every day I'm walking by and I'm watching this thing go up. And then one day, out of, out of nowhere, there's a big sign that says, traffic flow change. Next thing you know, you're over here, and now you're on this new bridge, and you're wondering, what the heck's going on with the old one? Here are all these cranes and everything, and it's like, 
don't tell me they're going to tear that one down. And they worked on it and worked on it and they were doing all kinds of stuff over there and it took forever and people were getting upset, you know, and all this kind of thing. And then next thing you know, they opened up Eastbound and it was nice. But then, guess what? When I'm coming home one day, traffic change. So now I'm on these same little lanes going between the two bridges, and now they're beating up on the westbound bridge. And they, and they, then they did whatever it was they did, and then finally, it's like the westbound did is done. And boy, that's this is good. They did a nice job. I, I didn't check the website. By the way, I understand the Forty Bridge has its own website. But I didn't check the website, but then uh, I often wondered, what the heck are they going to do with that thing in the middle that they spent all the money on? Then one day I'm going to North Randall, and then there's another sign, express lanes, this way. So now you've got two express lanes in the middle going eastbound, and two express lanes in the middle going westbound in the middle of the 480 bridge. So it took forever to get all of this finagling done, but you know what? It's, it's worked out nice. It's better than it was. That doesn't often happen. Uh, now there's a bridge by us called the Cedar Point Bridge. It's going to take them two and a half years to finish a bridge that goes over the Rocky River. Two and a half years. And the trouble is, there's people who live down there that now have to go all the way up and around Rather, because if they cross the bridge, it would be like a, a, a two-mile trip. Now it's like a five-mile trip. Yeah, she's waiting. She, she, she understands. Yes, she's been there. <laughs> so we don't like works in progress, especially if it uh, if it makes us makes things bad for us time-wise. And and the reason for that is all of a sudden we've gotten into a world where instant gratification and instant the, you know, time uh, elements are, no, are, are expect, expected normal. I take this course at Cleveland State. I take an exam. I get my I get my grade in thirty seconds. Now it's all done by computer, but it's thirty seconds. Everybody says, "Well, you mean you got to wait two weeks for the professor to grade the paper?" No, no, no. We, we I want to know right now. I remember a brochure that we. Uh, got in high school. In high school, they always have this one course that everybody has trouble teaching. They used to call it uh, sex education. But they gave us this brochure and it's had a statement in it that I never thought about. Do you realize that of almost all the species on Earth, human beings take the longest to become adults? We are works in progress, people. Why do you think we went to school for the first 18 years or 20 years of our lives? Well, because they wanted us, to, we were a work in progress. We had, to, we had to become adults. Now, some of us succeeded, some of us didn't, but we had to become adults. That was the reasoning. Now, we all think that once we reach adulthood, we know all there is to know. Takes you about three or four years to realize that's not true. One of the frustrations of being a Christian is that faith journeys are like that. It's a lifetime thing. It's not like a driver's license in Florida, or once you get a driver's license in Florida, it's yours for life. Uh, it doesn't work that way. As the Old Testament used the term, God was the potter and we are the clay. In those days, pottery was a very, very valued profession because they didn't have metal. So all their, everything they cooked in was, was made out of pottery. And uh, in order to make something that was a cylinder with a hole at the top, you needed a potter's wheel. I'm sure you've seen these. But basically, you know, in those days, there was a foot pedal that made it turn and you used your hands. And now, there could be no imperfections in the clay because that way when you fired it, it might crack, something like that. Potters had to ensure that there were no pebbles or any other impurities in that clay that they, so that none of that would ever happen. 
Now, Alan Nelson and he wrote a book entitled Broken in the Right Place, and he illustrates what a potter does. He tells us that true servanthood is not built on skills or position, but on those very character traits God has built throughout our work in progress. He talks about how when, when someone starts something and it starts to look like whatever it might be, a goblet or a bowl or something, and all of a sudden they find an imperfection. Even if they're almost done, they smash the thing and start over. Alan Nelson used this illustration to give us a powerful message. When we resist the master potter's hand, we run the risk of becoming less than we could become. We, could, we run the risk of having that crack develop. We know that God is the creator and God is with us every day of our lives. We can either accept God's hands and guidance and go where God leads us over the long haul or, and, uh, or do things the way we want every time our mood changes. It's when we do the latter that we become less than we can be. We become the type of thing that a potter would sell on the reduced price shelf. Despite all the evidence, people still try to improve themselves on their own. You know what, you know, I don't know about the thrift store, but you know what a lot of people buy each other this time of year? Self-help books. There are a lot of self-help books out there. And they're good Christmas presents. Now, no one ever knows that the person you give it to ever reads it, but they're good Christmas presents. Now, the best self-help guy anyone ever knew was Benjamin Franklin. I don't know if you know this, but Benjamin Franklin decided one day he was going to perfect himself. So what he did is he identified 13 bad habits he was going to eliminate. These were the 13. He said temperance. He says eat not to dullness and drink not to elevation. Silence. Speak not but what may benefit others or yourself. Avoid any trifling conversation. Order. Let all things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. Resolution. Resolve to perform what you want. Perform without fail what you resolve to do. Frugality. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself. That is, waste nothing. Industry, lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. Sincerity, use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly. And if you speak, speak accordingly. Justice, wrong no one by doing injuries or by admitting the benefits that are your duty. Moderation, avoid extremes. Forbear represent, resenting injuries as much as you think they deserve. Ta cleanliness. Tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation. Tranquility. Do be not disturbed at trifles or accidents common or unavoidable. Chastity. I won't go into that one. Uh, humility. Imitate Jesus and Socrates. Isn't that an interesting combination? Imitate Jesus and Socrates. Now, in order to track his progress, he developed this big, huge chart. And each week, he would attack one of these. And at first, he thought at the end of 13 weeks, he'd be done. But he found out that by the time he got week to week eight, week one starts showing up again. So at the end of 13 weeks, he covered them all, and then he started over. And he started over. And he continued to start over for the rest of his life. He never really got there. In Dr. Franklin's case, the piece of grit that caused him to start over was the one thing he didn't have on his list. Pride. Dr. Franklin admitted that pride would be the reason he would have to continue to go back over everything. Where did the pride come from? 
Dr. Franklin was trying to be the potter and the clay at the same time. That only led to partial success. So what's the lesson for us today? If someone as smart as Dr. Benjamin Franklin could not succeed in making themselves a special goblet, then we probably can't do it by ourselves either. That is why we need God's help. Let God be the potter, and the scriptures define the virtues for you. That will free us up to live the Christian life. We may not do everything right, but God is willing to keep the wheels spinning and continuing to mold us throughout our lifetime. If we allow God to smooth out the imperfections, then we will become the Christian vessel we all strive for. Our New Testament lesson shows what happens when people try to decide what Christian values should be rather than allowing God to be the potter. The Corinthian church had apparently strayed from what Paul and followers had taught them. Paul has learned the Corinthians had begun to practice sexual immorality, splinter into factions that disagreed with each other, and were misusing their spiritual gifts. Notice how Paul addresses this. He praises God, the, you know, the faithful God who continues to offer the church the grace of Jesus Christ. All they have to do is take advantage of it. Here's the message translation of what we read. God himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on track until all things are wrapped up in Jesus. God who got you started on this spiritual adventure shares with us the life of his Son and our Master Jesus. God will never give up on you. Never forget that. Simply put, Paul is sure that God the Potter will not smash uh, any church he founded and start over. That is because Paul uh, is sure that God sees the church at Corinth as a work in progress and hopes the church members will allow God the potter to smooth out their imperfections and mold them into the church that Paul knew that they could become. You know, it's the same with us. Our church is a work in progress. You know how I know? We come back every Sunday. That's the whole reason. We are a work in progress, and we continue to be helped on our faith journey. Today is the first Sunday in Advent. You know, some of the people here may have heard the Advent story 50, 60, or 70 times by now. But we continue to celebrate the, the birth of Jesus the same way every year. Why is that? Because we're still a work in progress, folks. We hear the words, peace on earth, year after year. But the unrest in the world requires that we be remembered, or be reminded. We have heard the story of Jesus' humble, humble birth, but as works in progress, we need to be reminded that Jesus was one of us. He was born like one of us. We sing Silent Night every year at this time, don't we? We keep doing that because we feel God's presence in a special way on that Christmas Eve night with the candles lit, don't we? As works in progress, we have to remember that Jesus is the reason for this whole season and that the message of the season should still inspire us because we're still working to become better Christians each and every day. We begin another Advent season. Are you ready to let this Advent experience help you to, help you to uh, be molded by God, even though we may leave from this place and go our separate directions? If you are, God is still your potter, and you will continue to be molded to become the best Christian you could ever be. Praise be to God. Amen.
Remember in our New, T uh, New Testament lesson, Paul talks about using your spiritual gifts. The church of Corinth had forgotten about that, and he reinforced the spiritual gifts that they had and asked them to use them for not only for the good of the church at Corinth, but for all Christians everywhere. That's one of the things that Advent is about. We have enough, you know, we give gifts on Christmas Day, but we have these gifts that we carry around inside of us. And this is a good time for them to come out. So let us dedicate the gifts that we have, the gifts that we brought, the gifts that we will be buying, or anything else that we may be doing to honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ during this Advent season. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, share in your abundance. We thank you for the opportunity to give gifts to others. Not only be receivers, but to be givers. And those gifts may be a kind word, or helping somebody with a door that's got two bags of uh, groceries or presents and can't get through. Or helping someone else try to find their way. Or making a meal for a friend. Or whatever we may be moved to do. Lord, we are preparing for the coming of your Son, who gave the most expensive gift in the history of the world, that is, the gift of his own life, to save us from sin. We thank you for all of these things. Amen. <laughs>
We thank you for your love and caring that you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for your son Jesus who strengthens us every day. So we will be blameless, as the Apostle Paul tells us, when he comes again. We, Lord, we thank you for convincing Israel and Hamas to agree to that ceasefire and hostage exchange that allowed humanitarian aid to flow. But Lord, the fighting has resumed and we ask for your help to restore the peace talks. Work with us as we try to keep other nations out of this conflict. We also ask your help to address the conflicts in the Ukraine, Ethiopia, and any other hot spots. Lord, this is the first week of Advent. Today we lit the candle of hope. We are thankful for the promise that you made through your son Jesus that your grace will be ours. That is the gift that we did not earn, but you're giving it to us anyway. And that gift is not only available just for today, but all the days to come. Lord, several of your children are experiencing periods of pain and distress or have simply lost their way. Today we offer special prayers for Pat who is, remains in the hospital and Cassie who just came home from the hospital and Jason who is under care in the Cleveland Clinic. Today we offer special prayers for Annie who has been recovering from surgery last week, Jenny who is in hospice care, Kenny who is dealing with two health issues, and Hilda who is in rehab. We pray for Lisa, Sue, Diane, Renee, and Jack, who have had long-term medical issues. We also pray for Harper, Mark, Eric, Kevin, Sandy, Karen, Darlene, Tony, and Linda. We also pray for those that we know about whose names we did not speak out loud today. You have known pe these people since before they were born. You know their plights at this very moment. We ask that you provide the guidance and healing that you know that they need. Help us to remember that we are to be your ambassadors in hope and love, not only for the people that we know, but for anyone you would lead us to. Lord God, we continue to pray for this community and, and this ministry. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion and the fellowship we will share after the service. We hope that our worship today pleases you, and we hope you will speak to us during the quiet times, not just this week, but in all the weeks to come. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, it is time for us to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. This is the sacrament that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave to us. And every time we celebrate it, we honor and remember him. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all who trust in him to share this feast which he has prepared for us. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, the risen Christ, the Messiah. Let us pray. Holy Lord, Father Almighty, everlasting God. Before your justice no one can stand, yet your love is so sure we need not hide ourselves. We thank you for your mercy reported by the prophets and shown in Jesus Christ, 
We thank you for the law you give to us and for the promise of new life, that life to live for you and with our neighbors. Great and wonderful are your works, Lord God Almighty. Your ways are just and true. With people of faith in all times and places, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, for you alone are holy. We thank you for your son Jesus who lived with us. He shared our joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was murdered by those he loved. We praise you that he is not dead, but he has risen to rule the world, and he is still friends with sinners. We trust him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate victory with him. Great God, give your Holy Spirit the, uh, the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup, so that we may be drawn together and made one with Christ the Lord. We may receive new life and remain glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. O oh God, you called us from death to life. We give ourselves to you and with the church through all the ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after thanking, uh, giving thanks and breaking it, he said, This is my body, given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let us share the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and he, made, he had everyone share it. And when he did this, he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let us share the cup together. My friends, remember, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. And now, my friends, let us conclude by reciting the prayer of dedication that is printed in your bulletin. We thank you, Father, for this supper shared in the spirit with your son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong and brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as you have served us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 271, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
see a, a house lit up, or every time you see uh, fancy decorations in a store, remember the whole purpose is to welcome our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because Christ came into the world, it allowed us to meet today, to work together, and to make the world a better place. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and every day to come. Amen.